Okay, hi. Uh, I don't know how long I know Marcella now, maybe for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, she's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's always fun to have her around because uh, I might have said that before, but Marcella is an anthropologist. And uh, then you'll ask like, how anthropology can link with service design. And I'm sure that Marcella will talk, us, will talk about that, will take us through uh, what uh, makes a good designer from an anthropological perspective. Uh, anthropology is about looking at the human being, but not as much about developing uh, uh, branding and looking like this kind of behavior. It can be that as well. But it's more about understanding to who we are talking, how we're talking to, in a more kind of diversified uh, spectrum. Um, Marcella, she's an experienced designer. She's been working in various companies for the last few years in London. Uh, she said to me earlier that I might be moving out uh, the country, leaving the country, who knows, in the future. Yeah. So uh, she. She's been traveling and she's been working with multicultural uh, environment and people. Uh, one of the projects that I call myself is a project that you did in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure, I hope that you will speak about that. No, Not really, but it's okay. fine. They can ask me questions. Okay. So you can ask, it was an interesting project. But it's not about me. I think, Marcella, thank you for coming tonight. Sure. And, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, can someone help me scroll down the presentation or Anastasia? Okay. Uh, do we need the lights? Fine. <laughs> can you please help me scroll down otherwise I have to be here the whole time. Ah, okay, I can do that for you. Thank you. You go ahead, I'll deal with that. Thanks. Sure, so I'll keep it uh, short. It's a short presentation actually, so you guys can have a lot of time afterwards to ask me questions and refer to the things Anastasius talked about, which I am not going to talk about tonight uh, really in this presentation. Um, what I wanted to do was something very practical that I wish uh, someone had done for me when I studied and no one really did. And um, it was first a paper I wrote recently and I published that on LinkedIn and it's the outcome of all my learnings uh, since I've been doing design work and um, I hope you find it useful. Um, also it's supposed to give you like a guideline of what real life or working in a design team should be like. Um, one last thing, my work is slightly more corporate than maybe what some of you guys are going to go into, but don't discard it um, because of that, because in the different environments I've worked in, uh, creative and not so creative, uh, the lessons apply. So just keep your minds open. Uh, I am going to refer to slightly more corporate work, but um, as a visual designer, as a brand designer, uh, it should apply. Thank you. So this is a quote by my favorite Western philosopher uh, uh, who wrote about Buddhism. And basically he talks a lot about change. And as you can see from the quote, um, he is just really saying the only way of dealing with change is to plunge into it and move with it. And that's going to be the framework of this talk. It's all about how to design in situations that are constantly changing and in flux. So this slide was supposed to be black. <laughs> These are um, the main trends uh, to design from at the moment. I read it in two different places. Um, the one is a Harari's book, um, Homo Deus, and the other one is a designer at a Futurology Institute, and these are the trends. The first one, of course, is climate change. The second one is the battle for an equal and democratic society. And the third one, which I think is the one we're going to focus the most on, 
is the rise of artificial intelligence. But I want you to think about this one not only as artificial intelligence, um, but also as automation and things that could potentially change the way we work and change the work we the, the way we interact with other humans. So why is this important? Let me, I think I'll, I want to operate this. That's this. Yeah. I'll just make it red because it was... Okay. It's important because um, in this industry, designers can help companies and businesses and people adapt faster to change by um, being empathetic to people's needs and to the business needs by helping businesses um, collaborate more, learn to fail fast and iterate, and by being observation and testing based. So in principle, this is the promise that um, a design team should deliver on for a business. In reality though, 70% uh, of transformation programs fail. So um, this is by Boston Consulting Group, and, and so as you can see, it's quite high. And the reasons for that vary, but amongst those reasons is lack of retention, um, acquisitions of uh, design companies that don't adapt, uh, whose culture clashes with the company that acquires them. Uh, other reasons include just not being fast enough in adapting to change. So, for instance, if you compare just I'm going to give obvious examples, just a, a, a type of bank like Monzo or Revolut with Lloyds, I mean there's no point of comparison, so um, in terms of transformation big companies have a hard time in going as quickly as, as startups. Um, and this results also in a, a different unequal skills distribution, so you will find people who know a lot about, let's say, trends and automation and AI, and you will find people in the same role in the company not knowing how to work um, collaboratively or online. And what this does is that obviously it creates disparity in the teams and it makes it really hard for the company to evolve and adapt to change. And the third one, of course, is that people are very scared, and I'm talking about business people, are really scared about automation. So a lot of the insights that I get from people in businesses is that um, maybe they fear that a process or a system is going to replace them, and that makes also change very difficult. So as you can see, with those three qualities that I explained um, before, um, you can help um, businesses um, collaborate more and design better um, and, and, and hopefully help them adapt faster. So these are the lessons. Um, let's see how can we apply them. The first one, the first one, <laughs> the first one, <laughs> again, it is to these sounds, all of them sound very obvious, but you're going to see why they are not so obvious. So the first one is to understand your design approach and communicate it clearly to other team members and stakeholders. So I will elaborate. So let's say you go into a project and you're given a task, um, you belong to a team, conventionally a team is um, structured, you're a visual designer or a brand manager, you have a product owner delivering whatever you're going to deliver, a website, an app, whatever that is, you have a project manager as well, which is making sure all the work is delivered, and you probably work with someone like myself doing service design strategy, and, and hopefully you will be working alongside UX designers. So in this scenario, it seems pretty straightforward what the roles and responsibilities of people are. But because they all come from different backgrounds, it's very easy to get misunderstandings. And what I mean by understanding your design process is to always follow, um, I mean, to always follow what you think should be the way of approaching a design project, whether that is a combination of using design thinking or lean or maybe just traditional approaches, uh, just lean back on what you know and try to communicate this approach early on to the rest of your team. 
and especially to the stakeholders. It does happen that the project manager does not understand what a UX designer does. And unfortunately, the project managers hold those relationships with the client. So if you are in that unfortunate situation, what you may find is that the project manager miscommunicated your approach to the client. So you are the first one who needs to be very clear on what approach you're taking and make sure everybody in your team and your stakeholder knows that approach. The second one is to try as much as you can to speak the language that your stakeholders speak. So again, it's a tricky one because in design we learn a lot of jargon and it becomes very organic to us or normal. So for instance, things like value proposition or things like wireframe or things like, uh, I don't know, in Agile you use uh, tons of vocabulary. Uh, they are not necessarily the language that your client speaks, but that doesn't mean they don't want to speak it or don't understand it. They just use different terms to define the same things. So my second advice would be to try and learn those terms and when you speak to them, try to speak to them in that language. Uh, it's far easier and it's half the battle to communicate at a, at a level that they understand. The third one that I quite like, this is a photo from my degree in Hyper Island and we did everything analog. So this was our final presentation and basically we were just drawing all our learnings from user research and we just sketched some personas and we wrote everything down. So it looks really uh, undone, but it was on purpose. So it is really important to share the progress of your work early on and this is regardless of the f uh, fidelity. I think as designers it's easy to fall into the trap of finishing deliverables quickly and making them look good. The problem with that is that uh, you get stuck and the work piles up. The other problem with that is that by the time your stakeholder sees the work, the work may have moved on and so you're behind. And the other important point is that if you don't get feedback early on, you are at the risk of doing too much of the wrong thing. And then by the time your stakeholder or client uh, sees the work, they won't agree with it and you have to redo everything. Um, it, it is important that you guys understand that even though if you start in a junior position, you still have a stakeholder, whether that stakeholder is your project manager, whether that stakeholder is your manager, your line manager, or your senior. So always treat all, everybody as a stakeholder, basically. And the fourth one is um, to focus on the outcome of the projects and not so much on, on the tools or the methods. Again, it is important. Um, I've had this in a few projects in which I focus maybe too much on me doing service design and defending that I'm doing service design because that's what I get paid to do, but the client doesn't really care how I get to where I need to get. They just care about how their businesses can be better. They just care about if it's a deliverable, they care about an app, uh, and they care about the app uh, aligning to what people want and what the business wants. So it is really important that you, in the back of your head, you always remember um, that your client has an outcome and that that's what matters to them, not so much what you use in order to get to that outcome. And then the next one is, it, yeah, it, it is a strange one. It's taken me a while uh, to understand that you can't just really be a specialist or like someone who keeps to themselves um, in this kind of work, uh, job because in reality you are the person who's going to keep people engaged and enthusiastic and um, sort of interested in the work you're doing because if you follow the design process there will be times in which things are really confusing and they lose momentum and the only way is to keep your morale high and to really just be the person who believes in the process and believes in what is going to happen. Um, and I have a struggle personally with this because there have been times in which the projects are really difficult and it's hard to see a way out 
but if you are not the person who believes in your work, uh, no one else will, basically. Um, the other one is um, if you're talking to clients or team uh, colleagues or people in other teams, try to bring something um, to illustrate your point, um, whether that is a low fidelity prototype or whether that is like a sketch of your idea or you get them into a room with a board and you draw. But it's, um, in my experience, it's far easier to engage them when you are showing them something. Um, in my line of work, people have a hard time visualizing things so they think in words uh, they don't think in, in, in pictures so it is important that you help them do that I don't I don't draw I don't make pictures so for me it takes even longer and it is harder to get my point across so I have to become very creative and just maybe try and use a digital tool to um, draw something or maybe use the skills that my colleagues have to do this so you can get creative with that um, the the other thing that relates to the first point that I spoke about about knowing your design process is that you have to believe in it and sort of uh, stand firmly by it because um, you're gonna be questioned uh, not only by your client but in your same team you're gonna you may be questioned by your project manager you may be questioned by um, the other designers of why have you made your decisions and I think this is really important because um, people think that uh, the creative process is one where you just come up with what you're gonna do and it's gonna be great and it's just an idea that you had and in reality there's a lot of thought and thinking process that goes behind that idea. So it is really important that you're able to establish and explain all the steps that you followed and why the outcome of your decisions. And also it is important sometimes to, that you show the evolution of your design. So how it did start from a sketch and whatever and how it iterated until it became what it is and keep all those versions in some kind of file and it is important that you show all those things, it, it will give you more credibility. But at the same time, and it sort of um, also contradicts a little bit this, um, try to be flexible with your approach. Uh, what I've encountered also a lot is that I start a project thinking that I'm going to do classical design, I'm going to do some research and then I'm going to arrive to something and then I'm going to go away and test some more and then I'm going to come back and then reality is very different. Uh, my stakeholders don't care or they don't believe in research or I don't have access to the right users or maybe they just want things done very quickly and they don't mind uh, what I do. So in those cases you really need to sit down and really assess what you're doing and be able to iterate and change courses when you need to. And the ninth one is to show that you have a vision and communicate this to the client and more importantly to your own leadership. So I feel like sometimes the problem is that um, in projects that where you don't have direct say in the brief or you know the person making decisions um, your approach or your vision tends to get diluted and it is important that that you understand where you're going in terms of okay I feel like my expertise or my design view is indicating x y and z um, it is important that you vocalize this and that you make it explicit uh, don't take it for granted and don't ask assume that because you know it and understand that people know it and understand it and it is important that you communicate this to the more senior people and the leadership because they don't always have a close view of what happens in the team and so you always have to try and keep a relationship with your own leadership and then the last one which is in, in relationship with that one is to be close to your team and to your company's um, uh, leadership because basically just having a tight relationship with them and cooperating and collaborating with them is what is going to get um, you to be successful and get your design through and be successful. Um, 
as you can see, it's a very, very short presentation because I do want you to ask a lot of questions rather. And um, yeah, hopefully learn something. I think. Right now I'm working for government. I'm working for the Department of Environment and Health. I'm going to bring a chair. Do you want to sit down? Or? No, I'm fine. Okay, I'm not going Thank to you. Okay, so I'm going to come down. Maybe we have a couple of... I'll bring the chair just in case. Okay. So we can have a discussion with them, some questions maybe. So, the... Uh, Lucas making a point. So when... Ah, okay, yes, go on. Can you walk us through some of your work? Um, I seen, should I give you an example of a typical project? Yeah. Sure. Uh, do you want me to go on your website or do you have... Yeah, why not? Let's go on their website. What would you prefer? Would you prefer product as in an app? Would you prefer a service? Both. Or would you prefer... Both. Okay, both. I think that, you okay, know Okay, cool. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Uh, uh, Marcela Sikansuego had to make a form, which is very basic governmental approach. I remember showing me in the past that how boring can be something you can make it creative, but you can discuss about it. <laughs> okay, cool. So this, is a, this was a, an app service. So basically it consisted on designing for um, um, hearing impaired people so they couldn't hear properly. This was not for government. This was for the hearing aids company in Italy. And basically our job was to launch this to market and the service consisted on um, providing remote assistance to hearing aids uh, customers. Um, and basically they would have access to their uh, audiologists whenever they had an issue with their hearing aid. And the app was supposed to do that for them. So basically, they would go into the app, book an appointment with the audiologist, report the problem, and hopefully get an appointment remotely with the audiologist. And that's it. Problem solved. As it turns out, it wasn't that simple. The, main, the, the way we approached it was to first speak to the guys who had this problem. So he was one of the... Um, hearing aids uh, customers I spoke to in America he was I think he was 29 and basically he wanted to play saxophone so he he played saxophone but he had to stop because he couldn't hear all the degrees of you know frequencies that he needed to hear and his dream was to have um, like a device or something that allowed him to, co to, to control his hearing aid so much so that he could hear all the frequencies. So basically you would have someone like that who is at this side of the spectrum, very tech savvy, expecting everything from the device, um, very, very clued up and with very high expectations. And you would have someone older who would never go into an app because that's not what they do and wouldn't be interested and they would want to be in front of an audiologist. So what, um, the challenge for designing was to design something that spoke to both uh, extremes, someone who's very, very tech savvy and who's younger and someone who's older and not so tech savvy. So that was the first challenge. And, and what we did to address it so you know, on top of doing research, we create a flow. So it would look something like this. It's blurred on purpose because it's confidential. But basically, it would be like a user um, experience design flow where you would start with what is the task that the user needs to do. So in this case, it would be a customer has a problem. What is the customer going to do? And then it will describe all, all the possible scenarios of the problem and, and all the things that they can do on the app. And then um, the way we work together was to um, do, uh, work in sprints. So we would have tasks or things that we should accomplish every two weeks. 
and then um, in terms of how we moved it forward we needed to evolve that view that you just saw into something more elaborate um, and eventually wireframes and eventually the app what happened in this project for instance is a good example of um, speaking the client's language of um, uh, collaborating with the client because in this case the client had expectations of the app just being an app and very quick and something that you can just imagine and deliver and we had issues trying to explain that this was a process that it couldn't just happen that that um, diagram that I just showed you had to go through several rounds of changes and iterations especially because the process was a very complex one because in parts of the journey you really got very technical so you had to understand a little bit of how the hearing aids worked and that you can't do as a designer you need the client to work with you there there is no no way around it and unfortunately because the project manager hadn't understood or maybe wasn't so interested in the in, in a design approach they didn't explain it properly and that created a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstandings so something like this a project like this could take up to I mean me alone I worked for four months on this project and it wasn't delivered and it could take up to six seven months but the expectations of the client were like to deliver like this in one two months is impossible you just can't yeah um, you said you had to work with uh, for tech savvy people so younger generation and the older generation right what do you have, what do you have in mind when you create a product like that that curates to both Let's say millennials and X. You have different journeys. You have to map out a, a very simple journey for someone older where you give the older person the option of calling, for instance, calling as in like press a button and make a call, or you give them the option of just booking the appointment and then go physically into into so everything. So you just change the journeys accordingly. So the one for every tech savvy person is all digital, so the person never leaves the app. Whereas for someone less tech savvy, you always give them options of going offline, of making a, f a phone call, of going and seeing the expert, of asking questions, for instance. But I mean, also what surprised me about here is that sometimes older people and less tech savvy people, their expectations of the technology were quite high. So they wanted, instead of a remote appointment with an audiologist, they would want an actual robot like an AI telling them here's your problem here's how to solve it done and then of course you can't do that not yet so that was funny because even though they were older and didn't understand the technology their expectation was quite high so that was interesting but the way you address it is by designing different journeys within that and uh, this one so this one grows and becomes quite huge eventually so traditionally between a UX, uh, a UX, a user researcher, someone like me and a visual designer would, would do this kind of work and make it look better after and then these become screens eventually yeah but I don't, I mean, my work goes up until before it becomes a screens or, or wireframes. I don't do that myself. Can you show us the service? Sorry? Can you show us service design? The service design. The on this service. piece? On this piece? On another project? Because this one wasn't delivered. I mean, it hasn't been delivered. Service on another project here. Um, it would look something like this. So it'll be more along the lines of this, which is just, this is very corporate, so we had to build a service design capability in an 18,000 people corporation, so really, really big. And we had to set up the organization in a way to work um, like I described, with multidisciplinary teams and a project manager that coordinates everything. And we had to teach them how to do service design. So in this case, what we did was to teach um, a few of these guys, uh, produce a lot of materials. Um, we taught them how to think 
process based of user research and then arrive to a conclusion, iterate, they did their own wireframes, they were designing a marketplace here. Um, and then we just create a process for them. So here um, they will start with a hypothesis, plan and create activities, do research and then arrive to a conclusion. By the way, service is much more uh, abstract than what I just showed you. So the first one I just showed you is a combination of service and UX and visual. And this one would be a combination of strategy, research and service. So it's, it's more abstract and, um, and it is intended to be like this because it's not a product. And um, in this case, for instance, the outcome, they had to design their own marketplace, which was a website basically, but that I don't put that on my website because it's not my outcome. I didn't design the website. I just designed the service to help them design the website, if that makes sense. So that's the difference. So it depends on really what you like doing. I feel like service designers are really good at seeing the big picture and at thinking, and then whereas UX designers are very granular and they're very capable of going down many, many different levels down, and then someone like a visual designer will take all those levels and, and like a big picture and make it into pretty screens together with the UX. So that's sort of how it works generally. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, Marcela, it's like um, service design is like it can be as clear as confusing. Yeah. So as you said, there are people that think that I am a, I graduating from a design course and I can work in easily in a service design, where I believe that an anthropologist, from your perspective, it will be a better fit. Do you want to describe a bit that your experience of being that field for a while now, for more than 15 years maybe? Yeah. So. Well, my transition was different because I started as an anthropologist doing marketing. Then I went from digital marketing to in what they call now user research, which is what I just explained. You would have an idea for a service, you work with a team, I would do all the research and the ethnography and would basically brief the designers on what I think should be, you know, the, the way. So it was far more strategic. And then now my role is a little bit of both. I mean, at least 50 or 60% of my job is research, but the other 40 is conceptualizing what those stages and what those steps are and those different journeys of why are you going to give um, all digital channels to a person and less to another person or, or how do you conceptualize your service over time so that it is successful. So it's, it's far, the picture is just far larger whereas as an anthropologist or as a user researcher is focused on, on discovery and the middle, so it stays here whereas a service it expands. UX maybe would be also expanded but narrow, they're very narrow, they just go down in a lot of levels. So yeah, there are differences and it's important to understand them because whenever you have a design job, even if it's not what you're doing, these are the people you're going to be working with um, because the industry, at least across digital, that is the team, uh, that's how teams are structured. So, yeah, that's pretty standard because I've been in quite a few places and they all follow similar structures. So how diverse is the, bagara, the, the, the environment or the people you work with in, in relation, for example, to the disciplines where the people come from? Yeah, they come from all over, but what I've seen is you will have um, um, someone who comes from research, so like a social scientist, uh, it could be a statistician now, some people who know a little bit about data, uh, social sciences. You will have someone who's more UX, um, so they will have done yeah, experience design UX, or some UXers come from visual design, so that happens too. You will have visual designers just doing just uh, doing cosmetic stuff, making the wireframes look very visual at a later point. So yeah, there is there is a visual designer resource there, and then there is someone like myself and service designers very in flavors. I've met all sorts. I mean, I've met people from IT. I've met business analysts who are service designers, I've met business architects, I mean 
mean, and I've met people like myself, it's very, very broad. And uh, I've also met people who are really good UXers and service designers. So it really varies. You yeah. S you, s you said, uh, and if you have any questions, just raise your hand and yeah, I, I will ask you to. So you said at the beginning, right? Uh, and, and I use this uh, kind of saying or term myself a lot. I, you, I wish someone had told me in the past about these things. So what do you think that you didn't get when you've been in, in, at the early stage of your career that you think that this, the most of the students here, they should know? Yeah, like what I said at the beginning, someone coming and telling me, look, in real life, this is what it looks like, this is what your job is going to be like, do this and don't do that. Like, if you want to succeed, do these 10 things and do not do these other 10 things because in reality, um, when you start your career, it's just that you're not going to end up doing anything that you learned. I mean, you want it's, it's just the way it is. I mean, and, and it happens to me still that everything I learned, I have to unlearn every single time I go into a new project because I have a new stakeholder who doesn't really understand or who doesn't really like or or someone who I just um, they has a different view, a systems view, or you start at a different point of the process or you start with a finding and have to move back to research and you just have to be so flexible and yeah I mean that that's what you mean people li like myself or any other people who are coming to these design roasts to share just what is like out there uh, let's say for example right that we have a geographer in the in the room okay hypothetically speaking <laughs> so what kind of how do you see someone that comes from a, or a built environment person okay so how do you see these people can engage or be part of the design service. Do you think there is space for them there? In designing the service? In design service overall, yeah, I don't know, in, in your field, in your area. A geographer and someone from building environment. It's very broad to things, which apparently we have two people in the room. Ah, okay, cool. Well, if you have research... <laughs> that changed the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> if you have research skills, research would be the most obvious place to start. But the other thing that you do is mapping out systems. So if it's someone in environment uh, who's used to think about big picture and how context influences actions, um, a lot of the work we do is mapping out um, how things connect to one another so it'll be in doing that or a systems thinking really so it's connecting why your service is connected to a broader picture and a broader picture and, and you map it out in something called service blueprint which if I find an example I'll show you one but okay. I don't think I have one here uh, any any question uh, from yeah, I like think like any question this. from the people here Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll have a question a bit. The, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an architect mm. and I'm interested in passive house design. And I'm intrigued that in Germany, in Austria, in Denmark, in Sweden, everybody's really embraced the environment. They're worried about it. You know, they're recycling like crazy, and it's really part of the culture. So it's not a technical problem. We know how to build passive houses in England as well, but we're not doing it because we've got some kind of cultural barriers. So when you're designing these systems, do you see cultural bias or cultural problems or cultural obstacles? And does your kind of anthropological uh, training and perspective and distance from it give you some some insights into why we're so behind in many ways in ecological things in the UK <laughs> I try and I don't get to do it um, because uh, yeah I mean my clients generally come with like making up as opposed to find the reason why uh, it's two different briefs and that's sad but that's just the way it is that I what I have learned about behavioral uh, things and now that I'm designing for government is that a big component of it is regulatory so unfortunately these things need to be regulated at first so you have to make them compulsory or kind of you have to penalize people 
to create the behavior. I cannot tell you why people in England don't and people in Germany do, but I can tell you how more likely than not they will do it, and it's by, by regulating the behavior and by penalizing it or rewarding it. And that's what a lot of behavioral scientists are doing. But um, in terms of culture, the things you how you do control for the biases will vary per culture. But yeah, again, in my work, I don't get that far right now. Yeah. So carrots and sticks. Um, it, it tends to work. It's nudging. It's subconscious in many cases. People don't need to really notice either. I mean, you can do it in such a way that they don't notice. But right now with policies, because we're designing environmental policies now, uh, we're going to make it regulatory. Basically, they will be penalized and rewarded. That's well, I'm, I'm, really to give an example of that, all right. uh, I'm working on a research project now with one of my colleagues. Uh, and um, we are trying, uh, it's a European funding project, uh, we're talking about like millions, we're talking about like five different countries engaged in the project, Lille, Belgium, Germany, here, etc. So anyway, um, the idea is like to, to build an a, a, a platform. I'm not sure what platform that would be actually. But the process of the co-design thinking and the process of understanding who the participants, who are the people that are going to be using it, is extremely important to come to the design brief. So the people that don't get that. So me and my colleague, we try, both designers, we're trying to convince people that, that there is a process. You can design something. They would like to see an app just because they want to see an app. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it will work or not. No. They want just to see an app. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have as designers or been in the design uh, field that we have to, to prove that we know what we're doing and it's not highly appreciated actually, especially for people that they're paying the money. Yeah, I think that's when the advice on knowing your process, communicating it in language that the business can understand. This is really, really important because the thing is sometimes you're speaking this about the same, but you're just not using the right words. And so, uh, it's a tricky one. You have to maintain your design point of view, but at the same time, you have to have credibility in front of the business. And in my experience, one of the best ways to do that is to speak their language. So, if you're gonna refer to a wireframe, but they call a wireframe a screen, call it a screen, even though you know it's a wireframe. Things like that. Sometimes clients like to see things on in, on in vision or on sketch already, the programs, and they, don't, and they like when it looks like life and when things move and are more colorful. And when you show them wireframes like very rough and ugly and not so pretty, like they get it but don't get it, they, they don't. And as much as you try to explain that it's not finished and that that's why they look so ugly, uh, they just don't care. So the compromise there is to try and do something that looks real, show it, share it, and socialize it, get the feedback and change it again. You just have to become very smart in not spending too much time in doing these exercises. Just spend the very minimum of time that you need in order to get your message across. And in doing that, look like an expert. So, Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any question? Any other? Right. Marcela, thank you very much thank for coming you. tonight. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Good night.